We're now, we're now on to our, our second major topic in the vibra uh, vibration section. Um, it's the undamped force vibration. So we, we got you warmed up with undamped and free vibrations. What do we mean by undamped force vibrations? The idea is instead of having it just freely bounce and oscillate back and forth, what we really want to analyze now is if we had the same basic mass spring system, right? so I'm drawing the exact same diagram, there's my x is equal to zero neutral point, everything stays the same. My one new thing, I'm going to put my hand on this block and I'm going to apply a force, okay, and this applied force is going to be throughout time. And I'm even going to add an extra twist to it. I'm going to have this force be in the form of a sinusoid in itself. So it'll be a, it'll be a sinusoid that looks like that. Okay? So basically I'm saying my hand itself has a certain frequency to it. I'm going to rock this mass back and forth with a frequency of an omega naught that is different than the frequency of the system omega n, the natural frequency. And this amplitude that the force that I'm applying, this amplitude that I'm going to apply it with is an f naught. And we have to either specify how big this force would be, et cetera. But that is the new twist, and that's what makes this vibration a forced vibration instead of a free vibration. So the question comes down to the following. Can we do the same thing and try to find a solution x of t that describes the entire oscillatory motion and behavior of this mass under th these conditions. Okay, so here's the, here's the setup. You're going to look at your sum of forces in the x direction, and the one big change is you're going to do your mx double dot clearly, right? And it's going to be equal to a negative kx, because no matter how you displace it, uh, the spring is still acting to restore it back to its neutral position, so that part stays the same. What's the one big change? Is that I got to add this extra force term in there. I got to add an F naught sine omega naught t to the right hand side. Okay. So that's the new twist. I'm going to rearrange this around. We've got a, a new partial, uh, a new ordinary differential equation to deal with, essentially. And this new ordinary differential equation looks like this. The left-hand side looks exactly the same. It's still got the x double dot and the x, still the m and the k. The only change is this right-hand side. And when we have something on the right-hand side that is not 0, okay, this becomes a new type of ordinary differential equation. So this is now a second order ordinary differential equation that is called non-homogeneous. Have you guys learned about non-homogeneous ordinary differential equations? ODE. Okay. Okay. So with this particular type of problem, there's actually a very specific term that we use to call this right-hand side. We call this a forcing function. This forcing function can take all sorts of forms, right? It could be exponential, it could be polynomial. In this particular case, we're actually making it really simple by choosing a sinusoid. In fact, I'm going to give you the answer right away. The solution of x of t for this particular differential equation is basically this. Okay, it is the same solution as for free vibrations with a new twist, and the new twist is New twist is there's one th extra term, a third term in the entire solution for x of t, which has the form 
like this. It's a sinusoid on its own, has a different frequency omega naught, and its amplitude is this big messy fraction that involves the F naught, the amplitude of your forcing function, with the spring constants and the natural frequency and everything else. Okay? So this is your final solution, and I'm just going to give that to you as our solution. Okay? Okay? So for the purposes of this course, we really just need to understand how to manipulate this and why this is the case. right? Um, uh, but I want to I also just take a little bit of time here, maybe for about 15 minutes or so, and just get into the mode of ordinary differential equations and how to solve them. Why is this actually the solution to this differential equation? Right? So what typically happens is when you're solving a non-homogeneous ODE, you're told that there is a solution that is a combination of two parts. One is the homogeneous part and one is this particular solution part. So how you solve this ODE is you think of it this way. Solution to ODE that is non-homogeneous is the following. The full solution, x of t, is what we say. It's a combination of x, c, plus x, p of t where xc represents what we call the complementary solution. Maybe in your math class they call it the homogeneous solution. Okay? And it is the part which represents what happens if the right hand side were zero. Okay? So it's almost as if in this differential equation, the right hand side always carries a zero around. And because it always carries a zero around, you always have a complementary solution that exists. And in this particular case, the complementary solution is always these two terms. This was my xc of t. Okay? We already did that. This xp of t, the p stands for particular solution. Right? And the particular solution arises because it has to satisfy this new non-zero term on the right-hand side. So this particular solution satisfies this right-hand side, the RHS. Okay? So I want to prove to you, how do we actually figure out exactly the form of this particular solution? And why does it work inside of this differential equation? Okay, so the approach is uh, for forcing functions, okay. So what did, you, what did you learn in your math class for forcing functions in non-homogeneous ODEs? Basically what you have to do is you have to kind of guess, right? It's a really ugly method where you guess solutions. based on the form of that right-hand side. So if your right-hand side is a polynomial, you actually guess polynomials. If your right-hand side is exponentials, you guess exponentials. So if our right-hand side is sinusoids, we're going to guess sinusoids, right? Guess sines and cosines in this case. And so what you can do is you can say, well, we should guess an xp of t. that instead of, instead of an A and a B as your amplitudes, what if I guess something like this, right? A sine omega naught t times an amplitude g, and maybe a d cosine omega naught t. So I'm guessing this because the frequency that I am applying in my forcing function is this omega naught, and the, the, the chance that I'll have a solution that actually fits this form 
is really, really high that it's going to work when I plug it into that differential equation. So here's my guess. And then how do you prove that the guess works? Or how do you figure out your g's and your d's? What we're going to do is we're going to take the first derivative and the second derivative. And then we're going to plug it into this left-hand side. And then we're going to make sure that the coefficients match on the two sides, making them equal to each other. Okay, so what I mean by that, let's do this. Let's do an x p dot, which gives me an omega naught g cos omega naught t minus omega naught d sine omega naught t. I'm going to do one more derivative, x p double dot. And this will give me negative omega naught squared g sine omega naught t minus omega naught squared d cos omega naught t. Okay, so if you can do that, next thing is I'm going to plug it into here. So I, uh, I needed an x double dot times an m plus a kx, right? So here's what it's going to look like. It's going to look like uh, x double dot plus k over m is equal to x double dot plus omega n squared x, OK? OK, so here's what, the, here's what the left-hand side should look like. The left-hand side should look like this. If I, if I make sure that I do my typical k divided by m, I'm going to get an omega n squared here. So here's what my left-hand side looks like. It'll look like xp double dot negative omega naught squared g sine omega naught t. OK. So that takes care of my omega, uh, that takes care of my x double dot. Now I'm going to add omega n squared times xp. So g sine omega naught t plus d cos omega naught t. So that's my entire left-hand side. And now my right-hand side is the following. It was what I, what I had was my forcing function, f naught, divided by the mass that I divided across the entire equation. So f naught over m sine omega naught t. Okay. Any questions on any questions on that? Okay. So that, this is how you this is how you do your ODEs, right? When you have a non-homogeneous problem, right? You do your derivatives and you make the now you got to make your make your coefficients uh, equal to each other. So what are our coefficients? Well, if I do my f naught over m, this coefficient is in front of my signs, right? So basically, I need it to be equal to this guy. And this guy, right? So for all of my sine terms, it's basically going to be negative omega naught g plus omega n g, omega n squared g, is equal to an f naught over m. Okay, and then we have all of our cosines, right? This guy and this guy here, and it's basically equal to 0. So for my cosines, it'll be negative omega naught d plus omega n squared d is equal to a 0 with the way that I've set up my forcing function. So this means quickly that d must be 0. And then it means that for the top one, g is equal to f naught over m 
divided by omega n squared minus omega naught squared. Okay? So this one is, a, is, a, is still a little bit messy. Uh, there's another way that it, it, it's sort of written in your textbook and the way that we like to use it uh, in, in, in most of the problems that we deal with. Uh, we really like to multiply it uh, or actually divide all the terms by omega n squared. So if I multiplied by, let's say, uh, k, oops, sorry, m over k, m over k is what? It's just 1 over omega n squared. So it would be as if I did the following. If I did that, this is just 1. The top becomes f naught over k. m over k is just the same as 1 over omega n squared. So this becomes a 1 minus omega naught squared over omega n squared. And this is my g constant that is in front of my particular solution. Okay? And so now after we've figured out g, we know what the particular solution is, you assemble the whole solution again. Assemble the whole solution for x of t equal to the complementary part plus the particular part, which leads to what I wrote previously. So I'm going to write this again, a sine omega nt, b cos omega nt, plus this, f naught over k. Okay, and so that's how, we, that's how we got this. That's how we got this three-term solution to the motion x of t. And with this now, we can do all the same things that we did with undamped free vibrations. I can ask you things like, you know, after a bit of time, right, how far do you think the mass has moved? What is its displacement? What might be its velocity? What is its acceleration, right? And I can even ask you for the period, for instance, of the, of the oscillation. OK, any, any questions on that derivation? OK, so yeah, go ahead. So how come we, when we do a sine sign in there, how come each side of all your sines is so two? You have omega naught, and none of them have omega n. Yeah, OK, so that's a, you mean this one right here? So, so the question is, why do all of the frequencies inside of my particular solution have omega naught? It's because I initially guessed that my particular solution always had the frequency omega naught. All right? And so if you take the first and second derivatives, that frequency stays as omega naught, and then the omega naught pops out. Now, now why did I guess that? What would happen if I guessed something completely different? So what would happen is this left-hand side would now have sines and cosines that would have, let's just, let me make up a Greek letter, right? Like let's say zeta. Zeta is my frequency now that I guessed. So everything on this left-hand side with the sines and cosines now has a zeta frequency. Are there any zeta frequencies on the right-hand side? No. So there would be no matching. You basically guessed wrong then. Your particular solution cannot have a frequency that is a zeta that is different than omega naught because none of it would match. None of the coefficients would match, and you would have guessed wrong completely. OK? Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in the third type of vibration we do, which is damped vibrations. Okay, so we'll get to that, but you don't actually need to worry about that here because all you're dealing with are sines and cosines, okay? So there's no, there's no, 
your, your question was, what happens if it's a duplicate, right? This is not a duplicate. Why? Because my omega naught is different than my omega n. OK? All right? OK, so, so, so don't jump ahead of me here. But eventually, we're going to have to ask the question, what happens if omega naught and omega n are the same, right? OK. Let's do, let's do one thing. If I, if I gave you that solution, what do I typically ask you guys to do to kind of visualize what the, what the oscillations look like? You should be able to draw the graph somehow, right? So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say, let's say I give you, and this is not even a physical one, just a mathematical one, but let me just say, you know, what does the graph look like for, let's just do x of t is equal to t 2 sine 4t plus 10 sine 0.5t. OK, I kept it really, really simple here. I've got two amplitudes, right? Perhaps, perhaps this, is the, this is the natural motion. So let me call this my xc of t. And maybe this is the one that is my, my particular solution. Like my hand is grabbing it, and I'm actually pushing it with like a greater amplitude. It's a 10 rather than a 2, right? OK? So how do you, how do you graph this? Right. I, made, I made it fairly easy in this case. They're just both signs, but there are two frequencies. Right? Okay, so the first thing is let me deal with my 10 sine 0.5t. OK, so say this is my t-axis. It's measured in seconds. OK, so let me draw my first sine curve. OK, so if this is a sine curve, this could be my sine 0.5t. If I make my amplitude equal to 10 here and negative 10 here, this is my x then this is just my 10 sine of 0.5t. But I have to be very careful about what this 0.5 means. The 0.5 actually means that I'm going at half a frequency, right? Half of one frequency. So instead of you know, a period, so my period is what? Period is equal to 2 pi divided by omega n. So my period in this case is 2 pi divided by 0.5. It's actually equal to 4 pi, okay? which means that right over here, this is like a 4 pi. And a 4 pi, 4 times 3.14, okay? this point is like a 12 and a half seconds of time before it took, or it took 12 and a half seconds of time for it to do one full cycle for this particular graph. Now I'm going to do my 2 sine 4t. So 2 means that my amplitude is 1 fifth, 2, 3, 4. So now my heights are here. And for every single one of my cycles, I'm actually going to fit 4. Actually, well, what I mean is I can fit 4 of these curves inside of half of a, half of a cycle. So it means right here, what I want to do is I want to divide this by 4. So if this is you know, 2 pi, I can fit four of these inside of 2 pi. And so my curve should look like this. Like that. Oops. Like that. Oops. Sorry. Draw that again. Mess that up. Like that, right? I can fit four of them inside of a half cycle. Okay? 
you take the two of these and you're basically super imposing them on top of each other. So the real graph is like this. Right, roughly speaking. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, I haven't drawn it correctly to scale and I haven't fit exactly four in these, but but that's the idea, right? You've got a low frequency vibration and it's superimposed on top of a higher frequency vibration and the amplitudes are different. So you're going to see these two things combined together and that's the look of this vibration, right? Okay. So hopefully you can start to visualize that and visualize the effect of having, you know, a hand that just grabs the mass and moves it back and forth. Okay, so there's your forced vibration, your introduction to the idea. Okay, so as you can see, I'm going to, re I'm going to revisit the following. I want to revisit this, this uh, amplitude here, the F naught over K 1 minus Okay. So this, this, is, this is a critical constant that sits in front of that, that solution to the particular solution, right? And we, obviously this is the amplitude of the forced vibration. Okay. And what we like to do is, if you look carefully at this F naught over K, what unit would F naught over K be? F naught over K would be a displacement, right? Think of, think of springs, right? Springs have forces that are a K times X. So anytime I take an F and I divide it by a K, my numerator here is clearly a displacement, okay? So F naught over K is a displacement. And so we know what the numerator does. What does the denominator do? Now the den denominator can be isolated all on its own. In fact, the denominator is typically given a, its own definition. We call it the magnification factor. And the magnification factor is essentially this. It's 1 over the 1 minus omega naught squared over omega n squared. Okay? And the idea is you basically take your, you basically take that G constant that I was talking about, the G from the ODE, from, from XP, right? So that G, that G amplitude, that, that solution, you take that and you divide it by the F naught over K value, okay? And this gives you a dimensionless number where there is no dimension associated with it. This MF is called the magnification factor. Oops. Magnification factor. And that's exactly what it is. Let's assume that you have an F naught over K and it's supposed to give you a certain displacement, but depending on the ratio of the frequency between the forcing function and the natural frequency of the system, this amplitude actually gets magnified, right? It's either going to scale and become bigger or smaller depending what, on, on what those frequencies are. Right, so let's, just a reminder, right? Reminder that, that my G constant that I wrote previously is, is this amplitude. Oops. It's basically my one 
over right so i'm taking this whole thing dividing it by that and just getting the denominator all by itself and then i'm giving it i'm just giving it a fancy name the fancy name is it's a magnification factor and all i'm really saying is make sure that when you do this look at the ratio between omega naught and omega n it gives you an idea of what type of amplification is going on in the in the problem okay now this magnification factor if it's dependent on omega naught and omega n it means that I can graph this so I can I can actually graph this mf as a function of omega naught over omega n okay let's look carefully at this magnification factor So if omega naught is much smaller than omega n, this is a fraction that is less than 1. Okay, when it's less than 1, 1 divided by a 1 minus something, that's a positive number. But it's a positive number that's smaller than 1. So it's everything that's positive and also bigger than 1. That's truly where amplification happens. In fact, the idea would be if this is an omega naught and you had zero frequency right here, MF would start at 1, and then it would quickly increase like this. Okay? And where would it increase to? It would increase to very specifically an asymptote, which is where omega naught omega n is equal to 1. When omega naught and omega n, if the ratio is equal to 1, it means they are equal, then what happens to the denominator? Goes to infinity. The denominator goes to 0, and the magnification factor goes to positive infinity from this side, right? Okay? What happens from the other end? So now I'm going to take omega naught over omega n, the ratio, as greater than 1. If it's greater than 1 underneath, in the denominator, we're going to get a negative number, right? And we're going to get a negative number where if you go all the way out to infinity, it'll just be, right? It will, it will be uh, basically 1 over negative infinity, so close to 0. So it's doing this. And then the closer you get to the asymptote, it's going to turn and go to negative infinity for the magnification factor if it's close to 1, but on the other side. OK? Yeah? I was wondering, why do we know that omega naught is good frequency and then when it decreases, it starts decreasing? Like, how do you know if it first gets bigger and bigger, then it's 1, and then like, it's smaller? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, like, if you plug this into a programmable calculator or in MATLAB or whatever software you have, it's just a function, right? All I'm, all I'm saying is, this is what the function would look like if you were to graph f of x is equal to 1 over 1 minus x squared. Right? I'm, not, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just saying x is my omega naught over omega n, and f is my magnification factor function. That's what it would look like. Right? Okay? So x is like an independent variable. Now, so what, what's basically going on here? What is this graph telling you? It's telling you some really interesting things. It's saying omega naught, if you hold your hand and you shake it, and you're at a frequency that's lower than the natural frequency, the k over m of the system, right? everything is going to be a positive mf, which means that everything is in phase. Okay? It means that whatever the, like picture a pendulum, right? A pendulum that was rocking back and forth, there's a certain phase to it, right? And so the phase, what I mean is, it was initially positive going this way, comes back down negative, OK? If the magnification factor is positive, you've kept in the same phase when it's positive, when it's negative. Everything here where it's negative, you've essentially entered the, the realm where things are out of phase, OK? In other words, the natural tendency for that system without the forcing function was to go positive, negative, positive, negative. And your forcing function, by applying that frequency, flipped it. Flipped the direction of the, the displacement, the amplitude, so that when it was supposed to be positive, it is now negative. Okay? 
And clearly, we already know what is going to happen at omega naught over omega n. What do you think is going to happen at this particular frequency? If you happen to have natural frequency of the system and you forced it with the exact same frequency, we end up with a situation called resonance. So basically, the, amp the amplitude just grows and grows and grows out of control. Okay. So this is resonance when omega naught is equal to omega n. Okay, any, any questions on, any questions on that? We, we're going to do a, we're going to do an example here shortly. In fact, let's do one right now. Okay, so let me, let me cover one more point before I do an example. Okay, I'm going to rewrite my solution here for a second. You don't have to you don't have to write this if you don't want to. Okay? But so this was my full solution, right? I want to just draw your attention to something. This was my complementary solution, and it came from my x double dot plus kx. Right? And this complementary solution really assumed something about the surface upon which the mass was going back and forth on. We said it was frictionless, right? So this is so far frictionless. Next section after this is we're going to do damped vibrations. And the word damped is synonymous with adding friction. So imagine I'm going to start adding friction to this particular system. Friction to a, a system with a mass and a spring, if you didn't have any forcing in it, eventually the friction is going to cause the oscillatory motion to die out. Friction is there to basically drive everything to zero. right? So this is what we actually call, you know, eventually, this will be a transient solution to the problem when, when there is damping. So transient solution, let me just change this again. We'll say, we'll say this part, transient when friction present. Okay, and we will get to that. But if this side of the solution is transient when, when there is damping, then this part of the solution, because it's a forcing function, we call that actually the steady state solution. In other words, when all the damping and all the friction has killed everything associated with the transient part of the solution, then the thing that remains is if your, if your hand is constantly at a frequency of omega naught, your system is going to respond to that at steady state. So we call this our steady state solution. OK? OK, so quick example just to wrap up the lecture then. We'll do the following. We'll do. A mass. with a spring attached to the ceiling, one attached to the floor. We've got a K1 and a K2. Some data for you. These are givens. OK? And I'm now going to apply my forcing function. I'm going to put my hand here, and I'm going to apply a capital P as my forcing function. 
And I'm going to say that my P is in the form of a sinusoid, 15 sine omega naught t. Okay, that's the new twist in this lecture. And I'm going to say for my problem, find the amplitude of vibration at steady state for two cases. A is when omega naught is 6 radians per second. And the second is when omega naught is 12 radians per second. That's it. OK? So 6 radians per second for omega naught. OK? So we're asking you amplitude of vibration at steady state in this particular case for a forced vibration. And we know that that amplitude, let me call it G again, is this, right? So what do we know? We know for sure that I have to figure out an equivalent spring constant. This k is the equivalent spring constant of the entire system. Okay? So my k is actually going to be two springs in parallel. So this should be a 324 Newton per meter. And so therefore, my omega n is square root of k over m, right? So this is square root of 324 divided by 4. It's a nice square root of 81. So omega n is 9 radians per second. OK? So now I know the k that goes here. My f naught is just this value, right? The amplitude of my forcing function. So that's got to be 15 newtons, like that. And so now I have all the bits and pieces to this amplitude. I just have to plug it all in. So it's more like a 15 divided by a 324. Just put the units in there. 324 Newton per meter. 1 minus, and then this is a 6 radians per second, divided by a 9 radians per second squared. Okay? Omega naught is less than omega n in this case because 6 radians less than what we calculated to be omega n. So this is going to be a positive magnification factor. And in fact, it leads to a 0 0.083 meters. MF is positive in phase. When t is 0, then what happens? Why did you say f0 is 15? Be because, because p is written in the form of an f0 sine omega0 t, right? Oh. Right? And, and basically, this f0, like you're, I'm basically trying to tell you how to plug in the right numbers based on everything that is in this particular problem, right? Those are the numbers that you're looking for. And you've got you to gotta remember, though, right? You got to remember that these symbols here, the f naught, the k, the omega at the, the omega naught, the omega n, they apply to my simplest case of a single mass and a single spring. 
And this example is the perfect indicator, right? I'm trying to tell you that when your springs get a little more complicated, the k that goes in here is always the equivalent spring constant, right? And just like, just like I, could, I could clearly add multiple p's, right? I could do a p here, and I could put all sorts of other p forces that are all at this sine omega naught t frequency, you have to combine all of them to get the right f naught that goes in here, right? And then the omega n is k over m square root, right? Like all of those things are, they have to be the, um, you know, after you've simplified it down to the equivalent spring constants and masses. So for B, this is the one with 12 radians per second. Uh, and so your amplitude is just going to be same for the top, the, the numerator. And then here's where it flips around. This is now essentially the case where I wanted to show you what happens when things are out of phase. So this is omega not greater than omega n. which leads to an MF that is less than zero, which means it is out of phase. And the G that I get here is negative 0 0.060 meters. OK? So I've been calling the amplitude G, but you know you can really call this Lots of people use different, num uh, different letters for this. I think someone, I've seen textbooks use like a capital X or something like that. It doesn't matter, right? It's just amplitude. Amplitude meaning, meaning this form of the equation right here. OK? Any questions on that? Topic of today, force vibrations. Un uh, yeah, go ahead. How would that look? How would what that do you? Would, so the question is physically, how would it look if it was just negative and out of phase? It's basically saying uh, that my, my solution, like just, just picture, the, picture the solution where my x of t is equal to a negative number and a constant. Your sinusoid just basically flipped around, right? So in other words, you were, um, you're, you, you, were, you were pushing this way, right? While you were pushing up, the system was actually moving in the opposite direction, which is odd to picture, but that's exactly what's going on. OK? All right, that's everything. I'll see you Friday. <laughs>